So in Wilford Hall Medical Center, at the time it was the premier medical center of the Air Force, there's a kid sitting in the waiting room. He's an airman basic, no rank on his sleeves, eighth of an inch haircut. He's sitting there and uh, he's been escorted in by a uh, uh, E4. So this airman basic's got very dark sunglasses on. He's uh, stumbling to get around the furniture. The E4 is leading him to his chair. He sits down in the waiting room. He's got his white cane. He's waiting to be seen by ophthalmology on uh, why he suddenly could not see. And um, a very attractive woman walks by. And the blind Airman Basic does this. And seated across the waiting room is a colonel who walks over to these two knuckleheads and says to them, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> what happens uh, when airmen first come into the Air Force? Of course, we have an all-volunteer force, so um, nobody's there against their will. But they go through basic military training. Um, they have a TI, training inspector. He's not their friend. He doesn't talk to them in a normal voice. He screams at them at the top of his lungs and they got to go through like, I don't know, seven weeks of this or something. Um, so this is like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting. You can just imagine what's going on here. Uh, now, the interesting thing is this airman may not consciously be malingering. Um, he's adapting to his situation. Uh, it's very stressful to have somebody screaming at you all the time, telling you you're stupid and you're out of shape and all that. And um, his way of adjusting to that situation, uh, his brain might have told him, we can't see. Now, now the TI is not yelling at him anymore. He gets preferential treatment. He gets to be led around. Uh, I don't know what happened in this particular case. But the whole point of basic military training is to stress these guys, to test their mettle. Uh, I suspect that a, this guy is not cut out for the, uh, the Air Force, because if uh, we go to war, is he going to cease to function? So um, I suspect he was probably, uh, probably asked to leave the Air Force. So psychological issues and optometry. Uh, a very kind and wise professor at my school, Pennsylvania College of Optometry, said that uh, never forget attached to every eyeball that crawls into your office is a person. And uh, people are complicated. There's a lot of uh, people have issues sometimes and uh, they may tell you stuff and it may not match with what's really going on. In Psychology 101, we were taught you don't say that a person is crazy. You say that they're maladjusted. <laughs> kind of a euphemism, I guess, but so be it. Yogi Berra said that uh, baseball is 90% mental. And the other half is physical. I think the same thing can be said for optometry. There's a tremendous amount of psychology in the practice of optometry. Um, how do you get people to comply? That's a, a kind of a leadership issue. Maybe the most common uh, psychological issue in optometry is uh, malingering children. Quite frequently, a kid uh, will have a friend who gets a pair of glasses and he'll decide he needs a pair of glasses too. Usually they're pretty easy to spot, um, starting with acuity. Um, as you know, anybody who's checked acuity, somebody will usually read a line and then they'll get one or two letters on the next line. But uh, kids don't understand that. So they'll read one line in its entirety and then say they can't read a single letter on the next line, which is kind of a tip off. And then, of course, you do retinoscopy and you find that they have no refractive error. So, you know, something's up. And uh, I used to love to clean the, uh, the, the plain old lenses in my trial set and make a big deal out of it, put it on the kid. And then they would bark off the 2020 line. Um, and the, the, the parents would usually apologize profusely. And I'd explain to them, don't worry about it. I usually go ahead and check their color vision. In the case of uh, the young males, it's probably a good thing to do so they know what the status is on the color vision. If they don't want to be a, if they want to be a pilot all their life, they, they know that's not going to happen, a military pilot anyway. I had a kid who was malingering, but he was the opposite. 
Um, he, he was uh, a little bit myopic, and uh, I did retinoscopy, did subjective, put the glasses on him. He, he didn't read any better. He, he, and uh, anyway, make a long story short, what happened was um, he ended up, we did an extensive workup on this guy, went to sent up ophthalmology, and anyway, finally he goes to psychology. They sent him to the psychologist. And he, had, the psychologist, he admits to the psychologist, he said, um, well, I didn't want to get glasses. So I talked to my friend and I asked him, what strategy can I use to not get glasses? And his friend said, well, hey, what, how about this? If the glasses don't help, they're not going to prescribe the glasses. <laughs> so that's what he did. <laughs> so, so the psychologist was very sharp and said, well, no problem. Dr. Stanek can fit you with contact lenses. So I put him back on my chair and I said, okay, let's do some preliminary testing on your contact lenses. And sure enough, we got him down to 2020. So <laughs> I felt kind of stupid on that one, but he threw me for a loop. This guy, uh, this kid was good. He was a little bit older. He was like, I don't know, 12. Not your typical malingerer, but uh, it worked out in the end. <laughs> People are complicated. One of my bosses, when he was in the army, he, uh, he had an administrative officer of the day, and uh, he was a captain. And he got, he got a call from one of the, uh, the ward nurses, and she said, um, we can't get this soldier to go to bed. So can you come and get him to go to bed? <laughs> so I think the nurse was like a major. You know? <laughs> and so uh, my boss is saying, he's walking to the, to the ward, and he's asking himself, what, what is he possibly going to say? to this guy to get him to go to bed. You know, the nurse, the major's already tried. He's just a captain. So he said, I went in there and I told the guy, go to bed. And he said, to my surprise, the guy turned around and, and went to bed. And it's kind of a, a sexist story, but uh, apparently this soldier needed to hear it from a guy, <laughs> even a guy that was outranked by the major, the nurse. <laughs> my first NCOIC in the army, he had AOD one time and he was walking down the hallway we had to do, do rounds, and I think he was walking through the hallway at 11 o'clock at night, and he heard this knocking noise coming out of, so he, he goes back, and there was a guy inside a phone booth that was in the wall. They used to have phone booths uh, in the wall like this before cell phones, and uh, the guy in the phone booth asked my friend Ray, uh, my NCOIC Ray, can you get me out of here? And... Uh, this wasn't Ray's first rodeo. He said to the guy, I'll be right back. He went over to the nearest phone and he called the psych ward. And he asked them, are you guys missing an inmate by chance? And they said, oh yeah, we are. Did you find him for us? And he, said, he told them where, they were, where he was. And so <laughs> I probably would have helped the guy out of the phone booth. But now, of course, maybe the guy was heavily medicated. You know? But uh, it was one of those accordion doors. You got to pull the middle <laughs> to get out. Kind of like a bathroom in an airplane. <laughs> One of the uh, technicians I worked with, Kathy, she was, uh, she, she was very well read. And she shared with me that when she was at technical school, which is where they learned to become ophthalmic technicians in Shepard Air Force Base, they, uh, they had skulls because they learned the bones of the orbit and the anatomy around the eye and whatnot. And uh, Kathy thought she was in a room by herself. And so she was reciting Hamlet with this skull, you know, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. Well, her sergeant was not familiar with Hamlet. He <laughs> was observing this from the next room through, a, through a, a door that was ajar and ends up sending Kathy to mental health because she thinks Kathy's gone off the deep end. <laughs> so Kathy walks into the, psychological, to the psychologist's office and the psychologist says to Kathy, uh, tell me why you are here. And Kathy explains what was happening. And the psychologist says, okay, get out of here. You're normal. <laughs> One of my bases, uh, there was an extern from a different school, and uh, he had a very strange haircut. His hair was very, very short on the sides, and it was very, very long on the top. And I asked one of his classmates, who was also there, um, who cuts this guy's hair? And um, the guy's classmate told me, well, what he does is he pulls it out at night. He's very nervous, very high-strung individual. Great optometry, great optometry extern, but um, very thin skin, very easy to, uh, to upset. And apparently he would sit in his room at night 
and pull on the hair on the side of his head and to the point where he'd pull it out. And the technical term is trichotillomania. Some people pull out their eyebrows, their eyelashes and all that. Um, unfortunately, this guy ended up, uh, after he graduated, um, and uh, a few years after he graduated, he ended up committing suicide. So very sad situation. I knew optometrist in the army and she had a patient come in, a young teenager who was very, very nearsighted, very, very introverted. And so Pat felt kind of bad for this girl. So she offered to fit this girl with contact lenses. And so the girl's coming back for her follow-ups and Pat said that she was kind of coming out of her shell. She was being a little more outgoing and stuff. And, and so that was nice. So um, her very last follow-up uh, her father brings uh, the patient in, and she's pregnant. <laughs> so, so poor Pat was just beside herself. She said, oh, my God, I created a monster. <laughs> when I was at Travis, we had a patient. This was during that anthrax scare when people were sending anthrax through the mail. We had a patient who was convinced that she was suffering from anthrax poisoning in uh it was very difficult, very exasperating dealing with this this uh, this uh, young lady. Um, we you know did a full eye exam; everything was normal, and she kept coming back. And uh, um, obviously, a, a case of uh, hypochondria. But uh, we even reached out to the patient representative. Uh, Travis was so big; they had a patient rep, and uh, and she, they said, "Oh yeah, we know about her." Almost every clinic in the entire medical group had been. Uh, you know, had seen this lady and she'd come back and back and back. But in the military, you know, the, the, the health cares were provided free and uh, it's sort of like an HMO setting. And so we had to be, you know, very professional, very cordial. And, uh, you know, it's like the, the boy that cried wolf. You know, you want to make sure that they don't have problems. So, uh, but it was extremely exasperating. But uh, fortunately, like my friend uh, with the, uh, the go to bed incident, I, I, at the end, I just said to her, look, everything's checking out fine. You are not suffering from anthrax poisoning. Um, that's it. And, and ultimately, she ended up accepting that. But uh, at the time, it took a lot of chair time, which was kind of unfortunate. We could have been seeing other patients. When I was at Brooks, at Brooks Air Force Base, there was a pilot candidate who was doing the um, pseudo-isochromatic plates. And um, he was naming the numbers off perfect. The only problem was he wasn't looking at the PIP book. So uh, we had uh, very sharp people that, that I work with at Brooks Air Force Base. And <laughs> the technician noticed this and um, he ended up get, getting sent for uh, additional color vision testing. And uh, unfortunately, he was color deficient. So a guy like that is too stupid to be a pilot. <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> so anyway, I did the Air War College. And when I was a captain, uh, a lieutenant colonel told me, the Air War College can't be that difficult because it's geared towards pilots. I remember in Psychology 101, the professor said that uh, sometimes a journalist or a researcher will get themselves committed to a mental institution. And it can be very difficult sometimes for them to get out because even though their behavior is normal, it can be construed or interpreted as abnormal. It's kind of like the, uh, the school children. There, there was a study where um, a teacher was told, you know, these six children are slow. Um, they really weren't slow. They were normal kids. They were average kids. And the teacher put them in a, you know, together in a special uh, row and started treating them differently. And sure enough, at the end of the year, those, at the end of the study, those students didn't perform in school as well. So our expectations can actually affect the outcome. I have to be careful not to prejudge, not to prejudge people. So this is just some, uh, psychological issues from an optometrist perspective. I'm not a psychologist. I did take a lot of psychology classes, but uh, 
but uh, mostly perception and psychophysics and all that stuff. Uh, Sure, horseshoe crabs, lateral inhibition, and all that. Maybe that helped me get into optometry school. Who knows? My father had an interesting take. My father was a physician, and uh, he wanted absolutely no part of psych psychiatry. He, he in his re and when he was an uh, intern, he uh, rotated through psychiatry, and he said all those people in that field are crazy, and the ones that aren't crazy, after a while hanging out with those people, become crazy. <laughs> Please put your uh, interesting psychological stories in the comment sections. I'm, I'm sure people have some doozies. <laughs> I'd love to read them. I'd love to read them.